Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, COVID-19 from the front lines. I'm Dr. Saskia Popescu, a senior infection prevention epidemiologist and a regular contributor for both contagion and infection control today. And I'll be your moderator for today's event. So we're so pleased to bring you to this webcast presented by both contagion, infection control today, and supported by the Physician's Education Resource. So before we begin, we have a few announcements. Um, this webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions at the end during the Q&A portion of the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to as many as we can. The slides will advance automatically during the event. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, please click on the question mark help widget on the dock in the bottom of your presentation window. This evening, we're very fortunate to have three very unique perspectives on what it's like being on the front lines during this pandemic of COVID-19. We hear from someone at the juncture of infectious disease, infection prevention, and critical care. We'll be updated on the latest from the clinical trial trenches, and we'll hear more about the human side of managing patients with COVID-19. So tonight, we're very excited and pleased to be joined by Dr. Kelly Cockett, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Associate Director of Infection Control, and Co-Director of Digital Innovation and Social Media Strategy at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We have Dr. Matthew Pullen, an infectious diseases and international medicine physician at the University of Minnesota, where he's involved in the clinical trial of hydroxychloroquine. And Mohina Lata, registered nurse at Kaiser Permanente in their intensive care unit. So I'd like to sit, specifically start by saying thank you for attending today. We're very excited to talk to you about what it's like being on the front lines. So before I hand this over to my um, panelists though, I'd like to actually start with a snapshot of the infection prevention perspective, what I'm really seeing on the front lines being an infection preventionist. So um, I won't spend too much time because we have such great panelists that I wanna turn it over to, but I think the first thing that I'd like to say is this is a very novel situation. Anytime we have a new disease, it's particularly stressful for infection control efforts because in many ways, we are building the bridge as we walk or run across it. So whether it comes to what kind of PPE we need to be using or making sure our disinfectants are effective, this is a challenging situation. And um, you know we're working hard to protect our healthcare workers, but know that as CDC and WHO guidance changes and modifies as we learn more about the disease, you know we're working to just keep up. So there are waves of this epidemic, and I think one of the challenges I'm seeing right now is that every state is really facing a very different and unique challenge. For those of us on the West Coast, you know, specifically in like Arizona and California, what we're seeing is vastly different than what we're seeing in New York. And I think that's hard because as New York is really battling a lot of this outbreak, for those, especially the hospitals in Arizona where I am, it's kind of bracing for impact. We're seeing this as a five minute warning. I call it the tornado warning. And I think that's really hard because a lot of people don't realize um, this is what we might see, but if we do our jobs right and everybody practices social distancing and all the infection control measures and we make sure our hospitals are ready, maybe it won't be that bad. Right now, we're also battling PPE or personal protective equipment and supply limitations. Um, I'm fortunate where we've started to really look at this for a while since February, but ultimately it's very scary because this is a situation we've never really encountered. Um, from the infection control perspective, you know, I always tell my healthcare workers, before you used to be able to just wear an N95 mask once and throw it away. We didn't have to be really good stewards of our resources. And now we're actually having to use them for an extended period of time which goes against the grain of what we've always done. And I think that's very scary for healthcare workers and we're having to go about disinfecting them and doing things that we might never have done before, but it's really um, kind of a trust exercise for us all. And I think it's a big piece of transparency between infection control and the frontline healthcare workers, just making sure they feel supported. Next are really the stresses on the healthcare system. Staffing is really challenging. Um, unfortunately for those hospitals that aren't feeling the hit quite yet. You know, I mentioned Arizona, we're having to maintain about 50% capacity and canceling all of our elective surgeries. So as you prepare for a surge, that means you don't have a lot of your healthcare workforces um, actually working because you want to save them for when that, that surge happens. And I think that's a bizarre situation because then you see New York where they can't get enough healthcare workers. So this is particularly challenging in a, a very weird um, dynamic right now. 
And last but not least, I wanted to just mention the changing and often inconsistent guidance. I think that this has been particularly hard from the infection control perspective because you know, what you see from CDC might be a little bit different than WHO. And anytime we have a novel disease, <laughs> we always go with a more PPE. We'd rather go all in and then kind of pull it back a little bit and decrease the PPE. And I think that's kind of a hard situation. You know, if I tell you to wear an N95 mask and then I drop that down to a regular procedural mask, you know, you might wonder, well, am I, am I still being safe? Um, why does the CDC say one thing, but the WHO another? And that can be particularly um, difficult and challenging to communicate that, but also as things are constantly changing. It kind of reminds me of what we saw with Ebola in 2014 and that we were very much learning as we go, which means we have to be very, very communicative, very um, empathetic, and just make sure everybody um, you know, is working together throughout all of this. So I really am just thankful so much for getting to speak to you guys tonight. And I'm gonna hand this over to our, our first presenter, Dr. Cockhut. Hey everyone, thank you so much. And that was a fantastic intro and segue into some of the things that I also want to touch on. So from a frontline perspective, I'm an infectious disease physician, I'm a critical care physician, and I work in infection control. So being at that intersection has provided a lot of insight to some of these issues with PPE, with the procedures, with how to mitigate all of the limitations and how to mitigate the confusing information and the ever-changing information. So I really want to talk about some of the things that we have struggled with as far as areas where we've had hiccups, points of confusion, things that have been hard to spread throughout um, a hospital system. So first, when we talk about varying information, how this virus is transmitted has been debated over and over again. And every new study that comes out, there is varying opinions on how that study should be interpreted. So we know that it's person to person, and we know that there are certainly respiratory droplets that spray out much like this photo when you cough or sneeze and can land on mucous membranes, other areas of our environment, and we can be inoculated with the infection either through direct access to those mucous membranes or from touching and self-inoculation. But there's been so much confusion about the idea of the phrase airborne and airborne isolation, droplet isolation, and what it means to have an aerosol or be aerosol generating. And that has led to a lot of confusion for many of our frontline staff on what is the right PPE and how do I stay safe? And so when we think through the PPE guidance, this has been something that we have had to really focus a lot of education on the idea that we definitely have droplet, we definitely have aerosol generation, but we don't necessarily have clear evidence of airborne transmission in the way we historically think of it, like with measles, where we have more sustained viral particles in these super small droplet nuclei that stay in the air for sustained periods. But when you do something aerosol generating for a period of time, you create that environment. And that, again, in an area where this is novel and there's new information, causes a lot of anxiety and confusion. So some of the problems with the pandemic that we have struggled with are the discussion and the use of the words airborne versus aerosol versus droplet. What is the correct PPE based on the guidance that you see from different organizations? The percent of patients requiring ICU care is particularly of a concern when you consider the amount of aerosol generation and the potential need for invasive ventilation. There's been a lot of early recommendation to intubate patients early for the intensive care unit, which subsequently has led to shortages of ventilators and now even shortages of our medications we use for sedation and relaxation from a neuromuscular standpoint for these patients. So we're coming full circle back to, should we really be intubating these patients in the ICU? What's the best management? We're struggling with what really should be called an aerosol generating procedure and should the PPE actually be different than what we're doing at baseline for taking care of these patients when there's not an aerosol generation happening. And then of course, as mentioned, we're all faced with significant resource limitations and pertinent to what I'm gonna talk about today, the limited PPE and our limited test capacities. 
So when we talk about our patients coming in with COVID, you know, this is an early article in symptomatology, but we very heavily are focusing on the fact that the virus is replicating in the nasopharyngeal area. And when we see this shortness of breath and cough, inherently there's capacity to generate an aerosol and droplet. And that symptomatology, again, raises a lot of concern for the transmissibility of the infection in routine care and even with simple management like nasal cannula for supplemental oxygen. And at what level does nasal cannula really cause a problem? And that drives a lot of PPE use, which is very difficult to mitigate because if we are afraid and we don't trust our PPE, and we are afraid that everything is turning into an aerosol generating procedure, we don't have the PPE to sustainably treat these patients mm -hmm. as such. And as we heard at the very beginning, we're struggling with how to extend use or how to reuse items such as N95 masks that we've not had to do before. And this particular figure has caused a lot of heartache regarding PPE. And it really falls back to the idea of what is the transmission mode of the virus. And when you have a statement from the CDC saying our preferred PPE is an N95 mask, which really is moving into that airborne transmission status, but it's acceptable to use a surgical mask, all other things being the same. The question of but what's right and what is acceptable and how much risk is any given healthcare worker on the front line willing to take for care of these patients? And that is very individualized and it becomes something that takes a lot of education and discussion and a lot of innovation to try to overcome the limited resources. And so I think this is one of the areas where we have really struggled and really struggled with, again, the statements being made online. And it becomes increasingly important when we talk about that level of PPE, when you think about the spectrum of illness. So we already talked about the respiratory component of this. And really, I'm not very concerned about our patients who are asymptomatic or mildly ill because that's the majority of them. But those small numbers of patients that go into the ICU, this reported 5% in this study. There's obviously other studies with variations in that percent. But 5% of a patient population in them market area for a hospital, requiring intensive care unit care, which inherently carries a fair amount of aerosol generation with it, is quite a large percentage. And how do we provide adequate care? And how do we manage the respiratory symptoms and the oxygenation in the best way we can? These images are striking with the ground glass that we see and the evolution to what we're seeing that looks like an ARDS picture. Classically, we have intubated patients and used mechanical ventilation for ARDS, although there was evolving, I should not say was, there has been evolving data that says we don't always need to do that and we can get by with non-invasive support with high flow oxygen or non-invasive things like BiPAP. However, the concern for aerosol generation with high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive oxygen support outside the mechanical ventilator drove the decision and early recommendations for early and aggressive intubation in these patients. And that is driving a lot of our shortages of supplies. And it's a very intensive and resource heavy management strategy. And now as we're looking at more and more data and less and less resources, the question continues to come back are the strategies we employed early on saying early intubation even the right thing to do anymore? And that may not be true. We may need to move back to prior ARDS management with non-invasive ventilation. And this is an area, again, as we talk about what's aerosol generating, what's not, what is the correct level of PPE, as all of this kind of cycles through in a novel scenario, we're continuing to have a lot of questions saying, well, initially we said this was aerosol generating, we couldn't use high flow nasal oxygen. It was something we were leaning against doing. We should intubate everybody, but now we can't intubate everybody. We don't have enough ventilators. We don't have enough PPE. So if we don't innovate them, then we go back to the aerosol generating question and we go through this cycle that is a very difficult one to move out of and very difficult to manage. And the question then 
quickly becomes, well, is there anything else we can do to treat these patients to avoid the ICU, to avoid um, the need for intubation or aerosol generating procedures? And I know you're gonna hear a little more about this, so I'm not going to belabor it at length, other than to say, we right now have a lot of ongoing research. There's a lot of ongoing studies, but we don't have the data from the randomized controlled trials yet to say that we have an evidence-based standard of care that clearly improves patient outcomes. So supportive therapy, supportive respiratory management is still going to be the cornerstone of treatment for the most ill patients in the hospital. And again, as we talk through that treatment strategy in a little more detail, just pausing again to look that moderate disease is where we start to see supplemental oxygen, but severe disease, we really have a lot of significant oxygen requirement and support that is non-invasive and invasive, all of which carry potentials for aerosol generation based on the way you manage these patients. And I wanna pause and talk again about this aerosol generating component because the confusion, we have known historically intubation is aerosol generating, induced sputum, coughing potentially has been considered that. But when you look at these statements coming out of the CDC, where anything that could generate a cough is considered aerosol generating. We're faced with aerosol generation in procedures we've never talked about this being a reality in. Transesophageal echocardiograms, electroconvulsive therapy. Anytime you have to use some type of respiratory support with, from a, a bag standpoint for a code where you're manually bagging an airway, anytime you get a sputum sample from a mini BAL or true bronchoscopy, we have historically thought of that, but we haven't thought about it from placing an NG tube, which patients will cough with. And so the question of where do you draw the line, if the question is any cough can do this, has become very difficult to help delineate and protocolize to balance again the risk of aerosol, the risk of infection transmission to our healthcare workers on the front line, and the PPE that we have that we have to preserve when and where we can. So coming full circle back to the idea of what can you do for PPE, some of the things that we've had to work through are, as mentioned, in some ways we're recycling, right? We're reducing, reusing, and recycling. How can you limit the amount of PPE you use by limiting the number of people going into a room that demand PPE use or extending the use of each mask? reusing things by sanitizing, which I'll touch on briefly, or recycling materials. There's ongoing work on sewing surgical masks with surgical wrapping that has previously just been sterile field or sterile supplies, and now recycling that to a new purpose for mask development in shortages. And you have to look at engineering options. So this is something on New England Journal, and the photo on the left is the aerosol generation during intubation with a standard mask in a simulated scenario. The photo on the right is actually one of my anesthesia colleagues intubating a patient using this intubation box to decrease the amount of aerosol. And this is one way to potentially limit PPE use because if you have a physical barrier that can catch the aerosol, you may not need the same level of PPE for the intubating person or everyone in the room. Or droplet precautions may by themselves be adequate because the aerosol is limited and caught. So thinking about innovative ways to again reduce and simplify PPE are really critical at this juncture for many institutions, and many institutions including our own. We've seen a lot of information about cloth mask use, and I mentioned that earlier. Again, CDC guidance coming out potentially um, using cloth, ma cloth masks if you don't have standard PPE available. That's caused a lot of confusion and a lot of concern about safety of that, but yet even for patients and visitors, this is an ongoing potential method for infection control. And then using different ways to sterilize a mask so this is the protocol that was put out from our institution on UV use for germicidal decontamination of N95s. And this is in process for all of our N95s. We use an extended use process and then the UV at night 
and get the masks back to our frontline healthcare workers on a daily basis with this process to really help again maintain a level of PPE for all these procedures and all of these varying potential aerosol generating procedures, but also in the setting of very limited supplies, we have to be able to extend these supplies and resources. <clears throat> so with that, I'll end here briefly on the balance of PPE and testing. How do you balance this in a complex scenario? It's not an easy process and it takes algorithms like this. When you have limited tests and limited PPE, how do you decide which procedures need it and which procedures don't? This is our OR protocol and procedural protocol on how to decide who should get tested, who gets what kind of PPE, and trying to walk through that difficult balance. And I think that's something that we're all facing that's very difficult and has to be nuanced to each institution. So with that, I will end there and say thank you to everyone on the call who's working on the front lines and for the opportunity to share. Thanks so much, Dr. Coffett. That was really fascinating. And I've actually employed you in Nebraska um, UV disinfection for the masks. So thank you for your hard work on that. Um, next, we have Dr. Pullen who's gonna discuss a little bit about what clinical trials are going on right now in that facet of this new um, pandemic. All right, <clears throat> thank you everyone for uh, coming on to watch. Uh, so my group at the University of Minnesota led by Dr. Bulwer uh, have started what's called the post-exposure prophylaxis and preemptive therapy for SARS coronavirus 2 pragmatic randomized clinical trial. It's a lot of words to say that we're doing a randomized controlled trial looking at uh, providing hydroxychloroquine for people that have a high risk exposure or for people who are in the early days of symptoms to see if it has any appreciable effect on the infection. So just a little background on hydroxychloroquine when it's been in the news so much. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. It was introduced in 1955 as an alternative to chloroquine. Uh, it has fewer adverse effects, lower rate of adverse effects. And the most common being GI upset, especially with higher doses. Uh, and uh, that can be averted to some extent by splitting the dose or lowering the dose. Uh, there's also uh, retinal disorders with chronic use and QT prolongation, uh, the most severe side effects being seizure disorder or QT prolongation. Uh, it's used often for malaria treatment and uh, malaria prophylaxis as well uh, at much higher doses uh, than we see in autoimmune disorder, which is one of the more common uses now. Uh, dosing is, is much higher for malaria, which is what we're basing our dosing on for our trial. So uh, why the focus on hydroxychloroquine? So uh, back in the original SARS coronavirus 1 outbreak in 2002, 2003, there was a rash of studies looking at potential new antivirals or uh, new antiviral use for old drugs. Uh, chloroquine was one of those drugs. Uh, in several studies, it was shown to have inhibitory effect on the spread of infection and the replication of the virus in vitro using Barrow cells. Uh, Vincent et al. in 2005 uh, did a study where they looked at both uh, washing cells with the uh, medication and media prior to infection, as well as washing them after infection. Uh, you can see on the image there on the slide that as the dose of chloroquine in the media increased, the amount of infection spread reduced. So uh, it's thought to have, uh, chloroquine is thought to have some antiviral effect and that's been expanded hydroxychloroquine in further studies. So uh, since the start of the 2000, uh, 2019 pandemic, uh, in vitro studies have emerged exploring the role of hydroxychloroquine, just like chloroquine in previous studies. Uh, a 2020 study by Yao et al. of China uh, performed a similar study to Vincent doing the media washes with hydroxychloroquine, both pre and post exposure, and showed similar results that uh, didn't inhibit viral replication and viral spread. Uh, a follow-up study again showed the efficacy of both chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in vitro uh, at reducing viral replication, but they actually took it a step further and uh, showed that these drugs could actually inhibit the uh, endosome to lysosome transition, meaning that it was actually inhibiting the uh, function of the cell that allows the virus to be degraded, free the nucleic acid, and then spread. So they, they added some mechanistic knowledge there as well. So in vitro knowledge is great, but that doesn't necessarily always translate to in vivo knowledge. So where do we stand on that? Uh, there have been a few small studies on human data. Uh, a lot of them out of China, uh, Chen and Gao et al. both had small studies 
at GAO was more of a review of several clinical studies that were ongoing with no real data being presented. Uh, China et al. had a very small study of hydroxychloroquine versus standard of care and did not show any real significant difference. Uh, the most famous of these studies was the uh, Gautre French study, the one that's been making the rounds in all the political circles and has been talking about so much. And uh, that one was very small and plagued with a lot of design and ethical issues. So the, while it may have been a good first start, uh, there's really not a whole lot that we can learn from that. Um, it's my understanding that today the same author, D.B. Raoult, uh, released a larger patient sta uh, sample size that showed similar results, but again, it was not controlled, it was not randomized, so it's questionable how much knowledge we can really gain from that. Uh, there was also a Brazilian study that came out two days ago uh, looking at severe patients that were uh, severe disease patients that were hospitalized. And uh, while they did show some efficacy, they also saw a marked increase in the number of uh, cardiac events rather than QT prolongation with a combination of hydroxychloroquine and zithromycin. Uh, it's notable, though, that they were using quite a high dosage. So it's possible that uh, that could have tied into it. They compared a high dose and low dose group and did see a higher rate of cardiac events in the high dose group. So it's again, another good first start, uh, but there were some design issues that may leave more questions. So with that lack of human data, uh, our team uh, in early March decided that uh, we were in a good position to find some of that data. So, Taking what Dr. Fauci says, you know, there's a lot of opinion and anecdotal evidence floating around about hydroxychloroquine, and a lot of people saying they feel like it's efficacious, they feel like it works, but we don't operate on how you feel in medicine, we operate on what the evidence and the data is. So that's where our study comes in. So our study is a randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial, and you can find it at that NCT number on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, we're targeting about 1,500 participants in each arm of the study. Uh, we're recruiting nationally via a REDCap survey system. We're also collaborating with McGill University, University of Manitoba, and University of Alberta up in Canada uh, to add another 1,500 people to each arm uh, from Canada as well to double our sample size. Our aims are to test if post-exposure prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine can prevent symptomatic COVID-19 disease in people with high-risk exposures. And we're also testing to see if this preemptive therapy for people who are already symptomatic with an early infection defined as within the first four days of symptom development, uh, if hydroxychloroquine can shorten the duration of symptoms and prevent progression to more severe disease. So our populations in the post-exposure trial, we're targeting two main groups, uh, healthcare workers that are, or first responders with known exposure to test confirmed uh, COVID-19 disease. Uh, that becomes a little hard when uh, early, it became a little hard early on when testing was lagging. Uh, people were saying, well, I, thought, I think I might have been exposed. We've tested the person, but it won't be back for seven days. Uh, so there was a bit of a lag there, but as it's, you know, in testing has increased and sped up, we've seen a better turnaround on that. Uh, we're also looking for household contacts of people with confirmed uh, SARS-CoV-2 contacts. In our preemptive arm, uh, we're looking for symptomatic people with a confirmed uh, COVID-19 test or uh, who are within the first days, uh, first four days of their symptoms and are not hospitalized. Or we're looking for persons who share a residence with someone who is a confirmed contact and that person is now showing symptoms, uh, the person enrolling. Or a healthcare worker in the first four days with compatible symptoms with a known contact. Our primary endpoints uh, are incidents of COVID-19 disease uh, in the, pre in the uh, post exposure trial. In the preemptive therapy trial, it's uh, an ordinal scale of coronavirus symptoms. And we collect data at screening on symptoms that they're experiencing, how long they've been experiencing them. And then at follow-up surveys over the next two weeks, we prompt them to, uh, again, answer questions about what symptoms they're having, how severe those symptoms are. Uh, our secondary endpoints are incidents of hospitalization, incidents of death, and incidents of um, uh, uh, coronavirus detection. Uh, data is collected through our screening survey. Uh, we've had about 13,000 people complete the screening survey at this point. Uh, and then if they're enrolled, they get multiple follow-up surveys over the next 10 days, typically on days 1, 3, 5, 10, and 14. And uh, on those days, we collect more information about symptoms, 
information about adverse effects from the medication, uh, if they've had further testing, if they were in the uh, post-exposure arm, we ask them if they've been tested since they enrolled and what the results of that test uh, were, or those tests were. Uh, our exclusion criteria, uh, again, current hospitalizations, we're targeting mild outpatient disease. We're not uh, looking for severe disease in these studies. Uh, allergy to hydroxychloroquine, obviously, we don't want to give someone a medication they're allergic to. Uh, retinal eye disease, known G6PD deficiency, known chronic kidney disease stage 4 or 5 or who are receiving dialysis, weight less than 40 kilograms, known porphyria, or current use of hydroxychloroquine or certain cardiac medications that are, keeps you prolonging or arrhythmogenic. Um, we didn't, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions from people about uh, looking at people who currently take hydroxychloroquine for rheumatic diseases. Um, you know, we, in particular, our study, we're not looking for those persons right now, uh, mostly because they're on a dose that's much lower than what we're studying. Uh, we start with a, a day one dose that's in total about 1,400 milligrams, so similar to a malaria loading dose. And then we drop that down to 600 milligrams. Uh, most persons taking the medication for autoimmune disorders are taking somewhere between two and 400 milligrams a day. So it's not quite what we're looking for. Uh, it's my understanding there are some rheumatology groups uh, based out of California that are doing a large survey of people taking this medication chronically. So uh, there may be data on those people coming out in the near future. So where are we so far? Uh, we've had our first interim uh, analysis by the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Board and that showed no safety issues uh, with the medication so far. We're having our 50% recruitment review by the DSMB next week. Uh, these tables show what the recruitment numbers were like as of three days ago. Since then, uh, we've hit about 790 people in our uh, post-exposure trial and about 290 in our treatment trial. So. Uh, recruitment has, you know, lagged a bit in the last week or so. We hope that it's because of flattening of the curve nationwide. Um, so hopefully that's the case. Uh, so uh, we also have started in the last week a pre-exposure prophylaxis trial. Uh, we opened that trial on Monday and since then have enrolled uh, about uh, 800 people. So that one has been recruiting quite well. <laughs> Um, in that study, we're, we're opening it for healthcare workers and first responders or other people at, at high risk for future exposures. And we're providing them with two months of hydroxychloroquine with frequent follow-up surveys to see if they uh, are protected from infection, what sorts of exposures they've had since they've started taking the medication. And that one is in collaboration with Vanderbilt University and Oregon Health and Science University. So uh, with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, for more details about our study, you can visit our website. It's covidpep.umn.edu. Uh, there's also a link to our PrEP study on that front page as well. Uh, you can also email covid19 at umn.edu, and you'll get an auto-reply with our information sheet and enrollment link. And uh, most likely, I will be the one viewing your email. So <laughs> uh, feel free to shoot us an email. And then a special thanks to our, our whole team, our uh, PI, Dr. Bullwear, and the other fellows and statisticians working with us here at Minnesota. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Pullen. I think that was something that not a lot of us know how it's going on right now with the clinical trials. So thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Our next speaker is Mohini Lada, who is a registered nurse in the intensive care units, and I think is gonna shed some really interesting light on what it's like for patient care right now. So I think from an infection control perspective, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this because I'm not sure if many people know, but for COVID patients or those under um, investigation for COVID, they're not allowed visitors. So the role of um, the clinical providers, the physicians and the nurses becomes very, very important. So I'm gonna turn it over to her. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, to start with, frontline staff during this pandemic outbreak are the heart of the healthcare organizations, I believe, because these patients who are either on life support or sedated, they do not have any families to come visit them, and they are unable to see them either. And uh, this is a big uh, gap. So it's very important for nurses, us nurses at the bedside, that we bridge this gap. And patients are in this situation who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or under investigation as well, are very scared, they're vulnerable, perhaps thinking that they might die. And most importantly of all, they feel they are alone. 
So this is the time when as a caregiver, as a bedside nurse, we just go in the room, of course, keep it up, hold their hands and talk to them that you are not alone. We as caregivers need to remember that the patient is someone's loved one, someone's father, someone's mother, child, grandparent, husband, or wife. And in this, in the ICU, most of the patients who are on mechanical ventilation, they are sedated or they are paralyzed using paralytics, and this is to rest their lungs and increase oxygenation. They can't talk, they cannot move, and they are amongst strangers. So imagine their fear. This is when, as a nurse, I would go in and say, you are not alone. It is very, very important for them to know that they are not alone. Because what I believe is when when these patients are really, really scared, first of all, all this hype in the social media that COVID kills is not true. And they are scared. So when somebody goes there, comforts them, they don't know this person, say, you are not alone. I got you. I am here for you. It is a big deal for them. It makes such a big difference, gives them energy to fight. And the nurses are the front lines. And not only do they, they are there passing meds, you know, repositioning them, doing everything possible to keep them comfortable. It is also important that they are making, making sure they have enough nutrition, you know, that they're, they're given the emotional support. And that emotional support, I would also say, is also the family needs it because they cannot come visit them. In my hospital, in my ICU, in the Kaiser San Jose, we utilize the face timing for the patients and the families. Once the patients are little coming around, they're coming to, we FaceTime with their family members and the family is able to see them, tell them, I love you. I want you to get better. I want you to come home. So these little things that we do, it is, it is so important. It gives them a little bit oomph to, for, their, for these patients to wanting to get better. Uh, positivity is so important in this at this time of this pandemic and i'm a strong believer of glass half full so even patients who are unconscious they can benefit from hearing encouraging words from their family members or their caregivers it gives them the ability to fight or wanting to get better if you know i believe if one loses the battle in their mind it's halfway already lost so it is important to give them some positivity in the ICU, we also have some sad endings. It's not always a happy ending. Uh, when things end sadly, families have shown gratitude that their loved, one, loved ones were not alone. And this, they say, when we have FaceTime with them, they know somebody was holding their loved one's hands. Somebody was there by their side. Their loved one did not pass away alone. Kindness goes a long way. In this profession, either you have it or not, so kindness and generosity is so important to have as a bedside nurse. You know, at uh, informing the families, those suffering from COVID-19, that their loved ones is in excellent hand. It is so important. It is more important than ever because the family is not there at the bedside to hold their hands of their loved ones. They're not, they cannot see them. The families do not are not able to see their loved ones either because just to prevent the spread of this pandemic, no visitors are allowed in the hospital. Caring in the family health experience is so is enhanced through actions that the nurses performs at the bedside. And then we show caring on behalf of the family as well. In this situation, you know, the nurses are the eyes and ears of the family members as well. When they call, we always talk to the family, give them a little bit of encouragement, whatever is out there, because a little one inch of encouragement goes a long way. And they, after they talk, after I talk to the family members, I always go and talk to my patients and say, hey, your wife called, your husband called, or your family member called, they said they love you. And I'm here for you. So we will get through this. Law and steady wins the race is always my motto. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohini. That was really, really enlightening. And I think it's something we all very much appreciate because communication with families during all of this is so critical for the patient's well-being. 
So I'd like to take a moment and thank you so much for all these informative presentations. And we're actually gonna jump into some questions. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of the presentation window. And our first question is, um, we hear a lot about ventilators, PPE, and now medications shortages. What are other equipment slash supply bottlenecks um, that we should be thinking about? Um, I can answer at least from some experiences that we've had. So we um, had a substantial shortage of nasopharyngeal swabs where we had all the reagents, but we didn't have the actual swab um, in supply that was gonna be adequate for the test needs. Um, so we looked into actually 3D printing and making our own because we could not get enough brought in um, through formal ordering channels. So that was one area that we had shortages. We've also seen shortages in the classic germicidal wipes that we were using at our hospital and had to start creating our own bleach-based um, diluted solutions to clean. We are in between places for wipes and now trying to triage how to use those wipes appropriately um, to prioritize them for things like the face shields and pappers in which the bleach can impact the visual acuity through the plastic covering of those. So those are two other areas we've seen significant shortages. Yes, we've, we've also seen those too. I think um, hand sanitizer has been one. It's been actually really impressive to see how some local breweries and distilleries are helping to create those for hospitals. Um, one thing I've, I've noticed, you mentioned the germicidal wipes. We've The bleach wipes are especially concerning because as I had to have a conversation today, if, if we run out of bleach wipes and we have C. diff patients, um, that's a big concern because COVID-19 is not the only disease we have going on right now. So it's weird things like that you didn't expect to have in short supply. <laughs> yeah, and kind of touching on the, the shortage of swab material, um, you know, we, uh, some of the labs in our building are designing tests to expand our testing capabilities in Minnesota and in Twin Cities specifically. And uh, the reagents for swabs and for research on COVID-19 uh, are becoming very scarce. Um, I know some of the labs are kind of getting the individual components and creating a lot of the reagents themselves, which is time consuming and costly, but if it's the only option, it's the only option. One other thing more specific to the IC that we've seen shortages of are the viral filters that go in ventilators and um, non-invasive or invasive um, devices, including the bags, the AMBU bags and things that we can use that would help decrease the amount of virus passing through the circuit there. And so that has been another area that I know nationally um, we've seen shortages to struggle with. I think also some capabilities like ECMO, um, you know, most, if hospitals are capable of doing that, they can only do it for a handful of patients because it is so resource intensive, both in personnel and materials. So um, we have another question. This question is for you, Mohini. Um, how do you keep finding the physical and mental strength to keep going to work every day through this pandemic. Um, so we're gonna open this up to everyone, but Mohini, this was for you. Well, that's actually a very good question. And uh, it's really, really not very easy all the time. You know, it's at the emotional level. The most important thing is as caregivers, we really have to take good care of ourselves, rest enough, keep social distancing, take uh, good care of ourselves in a way, exercise, eat right, so what we are physically healthy, so we can go in and take care of these sick patients. My strong belief is, I am a strong believer of prayer. I pray every day when I go to work. And uh, it's, it's my, my whole attitude is very positive. So, so it gets me get through the day. Um, we have seen nurses who do break out, they break down. It's, it's very hard. You have to be strong emotionally, physically, mentally to be able to handle it. But as human beings, we do have weaknesses where sometimes we give, we, we give it away. We just bring, it brings tears to our eyes sometimes. Uh, in that situation, I, I believe it's okay if you want to cry. It's okay if you want to take a five minute break and go back in the break room and just you know, just breathe in, breathe out, and you come back energized to start again. I, 
actually it worked 12 hour shifts and then I have pulled in a lot of extra hours because of we have a lot of uh, COVID-19 patients in our ICU. Uh, it's important that when I come home straight I go to shower and then I need to have good seven to eight hours of rest. That gives me the energy and the strength to go back. But uh, bottom line, emotional ways, I feel like I'm pretty strong emotionally, but my number one thing is, and I tell all my coworkers, we just have to pray. Let's get through this another day. We can do this. Yeah, care for the caregiver is very important right now. Um, I have another question. How long do you believe social distancing at its current level um, uh, will need to continue in the United States? Any thoughts? Well, I mean, I think it kind of, uh, there was a really good article I read today that I think hit it on the head with that. Um, you know, people keep asking how long it will have to occur in the nation, um, but we're not uh, seeing a singular pattern across the nation. It varies state by state, even community by community. So trying to create some sort of national unlocking date where we say, okay, on, on May 1st, everything will be back to normal. Uh, is just not going to be realistic. New York City is going to have a very different date than Omaha, Nebraska is going to have a very different date than Sacramento. It's it's going to have to be done at a, a local or state level to really decide when the best time to kind of start unlocking everything is. I think people don't realize that for as quickly as it can escalate, it's going to take twice as long to de-escalate. And Absolutely. it's going to be a very incremental, slow process. So we all need to just try and be patient. <laughs> um, I have a question for Dr. Pullen. Um, how did you choose the dosage for the hydrochloroquine in your study? Sure, so um, it's it's based on that Vincent 2005 study as well as a few that built on it. Um, in their study, they were looking at the molar concentration in the media that was required to really see the best effect at reducing the spread of virus. And then we correlated that to what concentration that would be in the blood. And we have some pharmacists on our team that helped us look at the pharmacokinetic data as far as um, what dose is safe to give, what dose will get us to that concentration quickly. And uh, we want to start with a loading dose to get people to that target concentration quickly, especially if they've been exposed. Um, you know, the medication won't do you any good if the protective concentration isn't reached for the first three or four days of taking the medication. So the first day is two large doses uh, spaced out about six to eight hours. Uh, so it's about 1,400 milligrams within the first 24 hours, which is similar to the dose you give in malaria. So it's not an unheard of dose. It's a dose that's been studied very well, been tolerated very well. The most common thing we're seeing is people saying they had a little bit of reflux or upset stomach, and then that goes away once they split the remaining doses or uh, just sleep it off, honestly. Um, and then after the first day, we back down to 600 milligrams per day. And that's, again, based on the, the pharmacokinetics of maintaining a certain concentration in the blood that would provide protection over 14 days. Thank you. Um, here's a question from the audience. Coming off a shift, what is the best way to protect my family when I come back home? Any thoughts? I'm one, I'm always one to take off my shoes. I leave them in the garage when I am. My hospital shoes are my hospital shoes. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, there's a lot of questions. And I know, um, you know, the idea of showering when you get home was raised. Um, so I think there's a couple things. One is you have to remember that when you come home, you still want to do all those same hygiene things. You want to clean your high-touch surfaces. You still want to be washing your hands or using hand sanitizer on entry and exit of your home. So um, like at our house, it's literally, you walk in and the first thing you walk into is a big tub of hand sanitizer to make sure that we're kind of advocating to do that, right? Um, the questions surrounding the efficacy of taking a shower or um, scrub change, whether it's at work or at home, is interesting because we do lack um, data to say that the virus is sustained viability in something like hair. So would your hair really be a high risk scenario? Probably not, we haven't seen that, but that being said, 
part of it is going to be what makes you feel comfortable when you get in the door of your house. And if you're wearing cloth masks, you're wanting to wash those right away. If you are wearing hospital scrubs that you have bought and they're bringing to and from home, you probably do want to bring those right in to get washed right away um, and not carrying them throughout the house, right? But again, is the risk super high from those particular materials? Probably not. The biggest things really are going to be hygiene and making sure that you're trusting your PPE at work and you know how to prevent yourself from getting sick because the biggest risk to your family is if you get sick. Yes, uh, I agree with you. And then also it's very important uh, for me when I leave work, uh, my hospital provides us scrubs. So I change the scrubs, get into my regular scrubs, which is clean come home, I have sanitizers in my car, clean my shoes, leave my shoes in the garage, put my bags away and go straight to the shower. After shower, come downstairs, then hug my kids. That's that's my routine. Yeah, I think my hospital has also been providing alcohol wipes for your phone. And that's been really helpful too, because I don't think we realize how often we touch our phones during the day and then we go to clean our hands, but our phones are quite dirty. So little things right. like that are really helpful. Um, I have another question. Are there protocols being established on PPE reuse by UV disinfection? How many uses are you getting out of the N95 masks that have been disinfected with UV light? Um, well, I know you just mentioned that you actually employed some of the UV disinfection too. Um, so I'll, I'll let you answer that also. But um, so one of the first endorsed protocols came out of University of Nebraska Medical Center, and it was actually referenced on the CDC website. So if you go look for UV protocols, the entire protocol is available that we established for N95 UV germicidal um, disinfection or decontamination. The question of how many uses you can get out of a given N95 is not an easy answer because it entirely depends on the person who's been wearing it and how long they've been wearing it, what the exposures may or may not have been. If you have goggles versus a face shield, the mask takes a different level of insult per given shift. And you know, if I wear it three times going in and out of a room, checking on a patient compared to someone who wore 12 continuous hours in the operating room, the longevity of the mask might be different. Um, and so each time we do this, we send it back to the healthcare workers and say, you need to check for the integrity of the mask. We need to check that your elastic still seems to hold the stretch that you expected. Nothing's broken, nothing's changed, nothing looks visually of concern. And if it is, to discard it. So we're not tracing it to say, you know, we can guarantee every person's going to get at least 10 uses because there's so many variables involved there. So, unsatisfying answer, I recognize, but it's a difficult thing to give a straight answer for. Yeah, I think um, the, the one thing I really emphasize when we've implemented the UV process with frontline staff is to kind of explain what it does. But then really, once you get that mask back, you need to do a quality assurance test on it, just like you should be with any PPE you get, but especially with this, because the last thing we want to be doing is using an N95 that isn't fitting like it should or might, you know, have a, a might be soiled in the front, anything like that. So um, having them be engaged in that process is really important. So the next question is, are there, I'm sorry, are there challenges with changing CDC guidance, <laughs> specifically the masks? So I'm going to leave that to you guys because I definitely have said that. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've had um, former classmates and colleagues that are at um, different hospitals, a few of them out in Seattle, uh, kind of at the first hospitals that saw these cases. And they've commented on that about how they have staff meetings at 7 a.m. at noon and then at 5 p.m. and you know in the, the the peak of all of this they were seeing new guidelines at every meeting which makes it a little hard to make sure you're being accurately and fully protected if everything's changing every few hours yeah i think that's I a really oh go ahead no, I was just going to say, I think the hard part from the infection control side is simply that, you know, we're racing to keep up to protect healthcare workers. And often I think um, that trust component is really important because our biggest priority is keeping them safe, but it's hard when that guidance changes and having to explain why that might happen. So, um, you know, for the frontline healthcare workers, that's, that's the challenge, at least from our perspective. <laughs> 
I think that's true. It's changing quickly and there's so much new data coming out. And then the frank shortages, right? And having to address shortages of PPE and how to adapt to that from a mask standpoint makes it really difficult in relation to mask use, what what types you should use, what to do next, what to do if you run out, whether you should start outsourcing them from somewhere else, ordering masks that may not be what you're fit to, but is it better than not having you know, an N95? So I think there's a lot of issues that definitely have made it difficult. Definitely. Mohini, do you have any um, thoughts on that? I'm sure from your perspective, it's it's been frustrating. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, it is quite frustrating uh, at, at my work. Uh, luckily, you know, we are given proper PPE and we haven't experienced shortage yet. Our managers do give out the mask and we do reuse it. But like, uh, you know, Kelly said, once you see it's visibly soiled, visibly broken, then you just discard it and get a new one. But it's also important how you doff your mask as well. So you keep it clean. You know, uh, what we have been taught by the, our infectious uh, disease um, doctors is you grab it like this and then you kind of bring the elastic front and then the second one. So, the, and then you either you put it like this, so that way you don't, you are not touching the inside of it. So that way the mask is still clean. And you just, the most important thing is you need to trust yourself how you are doffing because the only person who will get to wear the same mask is you. So that's very important to keep in mind. Thank you so much. I, yeah, I think this is a, a challenging time for everyone. So I really appreciate everybody sharing their perspectives, especially when it comes to changing guidance because we're, we're, very, we're all very much in the same boat. So unfortunately though, we are out of time and I wanted to thank the audience for attending and for participating in today's event. I